When Orca trainer Don Brancho died a violent death at SeaWorld in front of a live audience in 2010, SeaWorld blocked the truth until another trainer, John Hargrove, came forward to expose the real story, that orcas held in captivity was just wrong and a danger to both orcas and humans at SeaWorld. Hargrove's truth-telling was at the heart of the groundbreaking movie Blackfish. Today, he reflects on why he came forward and his love for the orcas he trained. That and more, next on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this behind-the-scenes look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, part one of our conversation with John Hargrove. He's the orca trainer who revealed the real story behind the violent deaths of trainer Don Broncho at SeaWorld and trainer Alexis Martinez in Loro, Spain. Orcas are beautiful animals in the wild, but in captivity, they're exploited and still very dangerous. In part one of my conversation with Hargrove, he talks about how he fell in love with orcas as a small boy and how they became his life's passion. He talks about SeaWorld as a cult and how he rose to prominence within the organization. And there he discovered a real love between himself and and the orcas. But it was while being forced to breed and artificially inseminate the orcas that he realized how wrong it was to be working at SeaWorld. That's when he told the producers of Blackfish he'd be willing to drop any anonymity and speak out for the animals. In part two, he talks about the future of SeaWorld and orca captivity globally. But in this episode, part one, we begin with the passions that came to him as a small boy, how SeaWorld worked its magic on him and how he broke through all that to reach the truth. Here's my conversation with John Hargrove, the former SeaWorld trainer turned voice for the orcas on the PETA podcast. John, you're a hero to so many animal rights activists for your criticism of the treatment of killer whales at SeaWorld and other facilities. So we're happy to have you here with us to tell your story. SeaWorld was just in the news for its $65 million settlement with shareholders after it downplayed the negative impact of the documentary Blackfish. And that's the film that you appeared in. Let's go back to the very beginning where you were a kid in Texas and you decided you wanted to train orchids. So begin by telling us what got you interested in the business of training whales and how you got into it. Well, as a child, I always, I loved all animals and I had no comprehension of what an orca was or even a dolphin at the age of six until I first went to SeaWorld, especially being in um, a very, very, very small town in Southeast Texas. Um, but once I went to SeaWorld and I saw that these animals, you know, what they were and what they looked like and how impressive they were and, you know, wh- how everybody feels about these animals, that they're just, you know, incredible and just magnificent. Um, and then to see a trainer in the water with them and interacting with them. And even at six years old, I comprehended that there was a relationship there. Like you would, how much I loved my dog. I could see that. Uh, with the trainer, with the killer whale and the water. And from that point forward, I was just obsessive about this is all I want to do with my life. There's nothing else I want to do. I want to do this. So you're six years old in Southeast Texas. What, what kind of town? 15,000 people population, especially at that time in the seventies. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it's right on the Louisiana border. So it's a, right on the in Gulf of Mexico. And, you know, we didn't have, especially be, being a child of the 70s and then, you know, later in the 80s, early 80s, you know, there wasn't that much information to begin with. So I didn't have access to just an overabundance of information about killer whales or dolphins. And, you know, I hate to say it. I hate to give SeaWorld any level of credit, but uh, that was my first exposure to it. But I have to also say... So people understand that my first impression of it was a lie, a lie Mm -hmm. that I continue to perpetuate throughout my career, which is this this illusion 
that everything is perfect and what a wonderful life these whales must live and, and the trainers with these whales, which is absolutely not the case. Yeah, but you were, you were six years old and the lie was working on you. Absolutely. And the, the propaganda, I mean, especially as a child, I mean, that propaganda, I mean, it sells you completely. And even as an adult, people are sold by the propaganda of SeaWorld. Um, you know, it's scary how convincing they can be to the public. I mean, even when there, there are facts that are on, you know, black and white or on television, at proving that what SeaWorld is saying is a lie, SeaWorld's, you know, advertising and their propaganda is so smart. And that's where I will give them credit. They're brilliant at their marketing. They're brilliant at that propaganda that they will make a, a, a person who doesn't know otherwise believe that what SeaWorld is saying is the truth and, and you should ignore what the judge says and ignore what the courts say and what the media reports say because SeaWorld must be telling the truth because that's what they said in their commercials. That's how scary it is. Yeah. And so you're six years old. Your your parents take you to SeaWorld and is it was it in San Antonio? Where was it? It was in Florida. The uh, oh, yeah. the Texas park had not opened yet. It opened in eighty eight. So the, my first experience was SeaWorld of Florida. And then once the Texas park was built, um, I went continuously to the, the Texas park all through growing up, um, you know, up until, you know, through, through 19. And then I began my career at age 20. You're there at six. You're every, every time you visit, you just feel deeper and deeper in, into the grips of SeaWorld or is it the orcas that are getting to you? Most importantly, it's the orcas, it's the animals, but mm -hmm. it's the indoctrination into all of it. You know, how spectacular the stadium looks with the music and the lights and the thousands and thousands of people in this stadium cheering. I mean, all of those, you know, you can't deny the effect that it has on your perception of what you're looking at, especially as a child. Mm hmm. And describe some of those feelings when, as a six-year-old, that that made you understand that, hey, this is going to be my life. Well, what describe some of those feelings? Because I know a lot of people are still trying to find that thing, you know, in life that says, hey, this is my thing, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, I felt very blessed in that aspect that at six years old and and throughout my childhood that I already knew what I wanted to do and I was passionate about it and I never wavered at first people joked and, you know, okay, that's nice. You know, <laughs> you know, thinking I was just a kid and my mind would change a million times. And when they saw that it never did, um, then people, you know, I get even till today, people saying you're the only person I know that as a child said that this is what they wanted to do. And then that's what they did. But, you know, I really was, um, I just saw it as a complete utopia. I, I really believed that it was a perfect um, world, that I would have this incredible life that the whales haven't had and will continue to have as I, as I work with them in my career, have this perfect existence. And, you know, how could anything be wrong with what I'm looking at? And, um, you know, it was... Uh, very much like an indoctrination into a cult. And it's been revealed. I've revealed in, in different interviews, not much, but, you know, I didn't have a perfect childhood. I don't think anybody did, but um, there was some really excessive stuff that happened in my childhood. And, and, you know, this was an escapism for me. I believe that, you know, all the problems and struggles that were happening um, as a child that this was my escape. If I could just hold on, that one day all of this would go away and I would have this utopian life um, with everything's perfect and I'm, I'm with these animals that I love and, and that, that would be it. And, you know, everything was an illusion. Yeah, and from your point of view, you saw this as perfection, as this utopian. What made it perfect? I mean, you mentioned some kind of distress or something in your personal life, what in the whale's life made you think, oh, this would be just the life? What, what was it about their life? When you don't know 
any different. And when you've never seen killer whales in the wild, which, you know, that took me until, you know, I was an adult, you know, and into my late thirties, early forties before I ever saw killer whales in the wild. So when you don't know what they're, you know, how they really live in their natural habitat, um, when you see these gigantic pools, you've never seen pools this size, you think that it's just, you know, how could it not be perfect um, for these animals? And you also know, realize and you're told, and it is true that SeaWorld is the largest in the world and they have the most money in the world. Um, and then when you do a show, when you watch a show as a child, and then later, you know, throughout my careers, I did shows, that was our purpose is that we're selling a product to the people. We're selling this illusion that what they're looking at is a utopian sense of life for both us and the whales. Um, the only thing that's true about what people are seeing in that show is that there is a 100% reciprocal relationship between the tra us, the trainers, and the killer whales. That's the only thing that's true. Everything else about it being perfect and the whales seemingly happy and we're happy and all of that is a lie. When you say your reciprocal relationship, do you mean that they felt something toward you and you felt the same thing. And, and that was the closed circuit thing that was important, that emotional closed circuit. Is that what you mean by reciprocal? Absolutely. And, you know, one indicator of that is that it takes so many years before you're allowed um, to work with these killer whales, not just because of your experience level and what your rank is, but also what your individual relationship is with that killer whale. And as your experience grows and you're promoted and you get to a higher and higher rank, um, you're spending more time with the more dangerous killer whales that already have an established aggressive history towards trainers. And you have to spend so much time before you can get in the water with those whales and build that relationship. And I, I would always teach younger trainers that your your best armor um, with these killer whales, because never forget that they are wild animals and they are apex predators, but your best armor in an aggressive scenario is your relationship. And that is absolutely the truth. And it has saved me countless times throughout my career, my relationship. So you build up this relationship, you're, you're moving up the chain as a trainer at SeaWorld. And when you first got there, how old were you? And and when you became senior, what what was the how old were you then? Well, fortunately for me, I started when I was very very young. I actually swim tested when I was 19 years old. I was enrolled full time at University of Houston, Seaward of Texas. Senior management invited me to swim test, and I passed the swim test. And once all the paperwork went through, I had just turned 20 years old when I began my career. Um, by the time I reached senior trainer, which um, I was promoted as fast as you could be promoted because we had, time, you know, uh, minimum time requirements before each level. And, and of course, things that you had to prove that you were proficient, proficient in before you could be promoted. And I was promoted as fast as you could be promoted. And I the first time I got in the water, I was uh, I had four and a half years of experience. And that was consider, considered amazingly fast. I knew, I knew and worked with trainers that the first time they ever got in the water with a killer whale, they, didn't, they had 10 years of experience before they were allowed to do so. So I was really fast tracked. But because also I was so devoted, I was so passionate and I was really obsessive about it to succeed in this career and to go as high as I could so that I could do everything with, with every single one of the killer whales, including the most dangerous. Did you feel, or did people react to you like, oh, this guy must be half orca. He's relating to the orca so much. Or did they, they know that there was something different with you and the orcas? This guy's practically an orca himself. Did you ever get, <laughs> well, that, kind, did you ever get that kind of reaction? I, I did get a reaction that I was different and that I was definitely made for Shamu Stadium. And, and one of the examples of that was um, as a lower, I, I started at Shamu Stadium as an apprentice, uh, just like Don Branchaw did. But then, you know, it was a requirement that then you, you as a lower level ranked trainer, but before you could come back to Shamu Stadium and actually get in the water and do things and do shows, 
you had to either go to Dolphin or go to Sea Lion Stadium and, and get experience on animals that couldn't kill you. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so you could learn from your mistakes and develop as a trainer. And then if management felt you were strong enough, they, they would bring you back to Shamu Stadium and then you would have to prove, prove yourself all over again and constantly uh, in order to stay there. But I, when I, I spent my, um, younger days um, at Sea Lion Stadium, just like Don Branshaw did. And um, when they brought me back to Shamu Stadium, I was the first trainer in 10 years that they did not make go through Dolphin Stadium to come to Killerwell Stadium. They just brought me straight from Sea Lion Stadium because they felt I was so strong. Um, yeah, that's like being a baseball player, being drafted out of high school, playing in the pros, right? It certainly felt that way. Um, and, you know, it was for a lot of my colleagues that I worked with, you know, it, it was to be expected. You know, of course, you know, some colleagues I worked with, there was some jealousy with that because nearly every trainer, that was what they wanted was to be at Shamu Stadium. And so, you know, I passed a lot of people up who had more experience than I did or have been at sea lion longer or, or who had been at sea lion and then went to dolphin and were still waiting for their opportunity to hopefully go to Shamu. And then all of a sudden management just brings me to Shamu stadium. And, you know, at the time I'm like 23 years old and, um, you know, I did not have to go to dolphin stadium at all. And again, the last time that that had happened was a decade before. Uh, with Sharon Veets, which, you know, a friend of mine and, and someone who I worked with. So now you, you must have felt at that at that stage, you know, you're 23. You must have felt it was all you. You're in the big time. What did the orcas? How did the orcas react to you? They must have helped you. Or do you think you were controlling them? Describe that relationship that enabled you to rise that quickly. You know, I, it's a, that's a great question because I, this is something that I also would teach younger trainers is that, um, these whales can make you look like a rock star or they can make you look like a clown and how strong your relationship is and how, how, um, genuine and authentic your relationship is with these whales will determine how they respond. These whales are so smart. And the relationships are so strong, they discriminate between trainers. So there are mm. trainers that these whales do not like. And they would take them out for a show and they would just, these whales would humiliate them in the sense that they would just not do what they were asked. They didn't care about the food. They were mm. just like, they had no respect for this trainer. And they were just going to, as we would call it, take them to the cleaners. Mm. Um, you know, so I've had whales that, Definitely, like, you know, my foot had slipped or I was and something had happened and it pushed pushed me in the wrong position where it really could have caused a fatal or very serious injury. And the whales then made a compensation that they knew would make them fail in the behavior, but mm. they did it so that I would not get hurt, so that I could, that I wouldn't fall, that I wouldn't be landed on or I wouldn't be thrown over a, the stage or the glass or whatever. And, and that happened, you know, many times in my career where these whales made that decision to, like, save me. Yeah, that means they cared about you. Absolutely, they care about you, without doubt, without question. I mean, these animals are, and, and you know, this is the part that makes it so uh, just crippling to leave them. Um, and, you know, because, you know, a, a lot of times when I'm in interviews, sometimes people will challenge back like, well, why did you stay so long? And it's like, look, you have not until you've walked even just one step in my shoes. You can't judge me that way. I, I gave everything to this career. It was my identity, you know, from a from a child. And then certainly as an adult, it was my identity. Um, but most importantly, you know, I'd put. Every weekend, every holiday with these whales and these, I had such a strong relationship with them. I love them more than anything else. And to walk away from that and know that I can go on with my life and these whales would stay, have, be forced to stay in these concrete 
tanks, pools, whatever you want to call them, and chemically treated water was, was um, you know, you had an overwhelming, I still do, an overwhelming sense of guilt that I just, mm. you know, betrayed them. John, you, met, you mentioned guilt and betrayal, the, all the emotions. And then you mentioned in that little passage there, you mentioned love. Was there real love? And, and you mentioned reciprocation before. Was there, that, was there that love really between you and the whale? And was it reciprocated? And was it that powerful? That, I, I think that's what maybe some people might have a hard time understanding. Yeah, I, I know that they, I, I can understand why people would have a hard time understanding because, you know, killer whales don't exhibit um, like emotion or, or like the way a dog would. And people are, people are seeing it through the lens of like what they know as a, as a domesticated cat or dog and how their cat or dog responds to them. Now, obviously, an orca is not going to respond the way a, a dog does when you know that they're loyal and when they're happy to see you but they do respond and there there are behavioral things that happen i mean you know noticeable behavioral changes um identifiers that you see we as killer whale trainers see them do that represent all of those same types of emotions of happiness to see you uh loyalty uh discriminating um, against another trainer because they want to be with you instead. Um, you know, you, you still see all of those things. Uh, it's just, it's hard to explain it to the public because they don't, they've never seen that. They don't know what that looks like. But you have no doubt it, it was real. It, absolutely, 100% real. And a great example is Takara. Uh, Takara and I spent years together, uh, working together, swimming together, performing together. At SeaWorld of California, um, I I then left and went to France to run that Killerwell Stadium, and then came back to SeaWorld. And I was at the Texas Park. Takara was shipped off to to Florida, and then from Florida she came back to Texas. What was the special bond that you had with Takara? Yeah, Takara and I it was it was incredibly special, and all the other trainers that I worked with. Including a you know the very the very top at Shamu Stadium recognized that um, and you know for example Takara because of her aggressive past towards trainers she has a limited team just like Tilikum did and Kasaka did any whale that is has a known aggressive history towards trainers and, and is considered to be more dangerous than others uh, that will have a limited team to the most experienced trainers. So, for example, only four of us in Texas swam with Takara. And out of those us four, we were the top ranked at Shamu Stadium in Texas, and I was her team leader. And the reason why I was her team leader is because I had the strongest relationship with her because I had a history with Takara going all the way back to where she was born in the California park. So I, I worked and swam with and performed with Takara for years in California before we both went different directions. And then we both ended up back at the at SeaWorld of Texas. Um, so Takara had been shipped off to Florida. Um, I, I left SeaWorld of California to run the killer whale facility, um, in, on the French Riviera in France. And then when I came back to SeaWorld, I went to the Texas park. Then Takara was transported from Florida to Texas. And when we were reunited, um, you know, I, I saw an animal that spirit was very broken. Um, it was not the Takara I remembered in California, who was very happy. She was um, you know, she was with her mother. And, um, and now when I'm seeing Takara again for the first time since then, she had been taken away from her mother, Kasaka. Um, she has had two calves that they, she's been taken away from both of her, her, her calves. And now she's pregnant with her third and being mm-hmm. shipped on a plane to Texas to a brand new killer whale stadium with brand new whales. So she was a broken animal physically, um, uh, spiritually, she was broken. I could see it in her. And when we first saw each other, she saw me and I saw her. I mean, of course, I'm ecstatic to see Takara again because I loved her so much and missed her. And then the 
how Takara responded and reacted when she first saw me. It was, it was amazing. It was, it's, it's, it's those types of things that why you, you know, 99.9% of trainers want to be a trainer and just her vocalizations and her behavior and how she responded. And I was just like, my goal at that point was I, I'm going to, I'm going to try my best to remind her of SeaWorld of California, because that was when she was her happiest in captivity. And, you know, I have to preface that and make sure that people know, like when I say happy related to Takara, happy as happy as she could be in a, in a confined environment. She just lit up when she saw you. She always did too. Always did. But you had to feel a little guilty too, because now you were going to say, now you got to do the things that they expect us to do. At some point, that's got to weigh on you, right? Because you lo- you love this animal, and now you got to make it do things that you may not want her to do. You know, a lot of times, like for the, say, the less um, horrific aspects of it, meaning artificial insemination and things like that, which I definitely was opposed to at the end of my career and tried to stop, um, you know, them from doing and 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 when I say them, they gave us a directive and I had to do it. Um, but on the, on the day to day, like shows and stuff like that, I broke a lot of the rules with Takara, um, mm-hmm. because things that she liked to do and, and Texas management was very scary. There was scared the whales were going to attack us and, and, you know, they would make all these restrictions and Takara, because of my strong relationship with her, I knew I could, I could take her very far and she enjoyed it. And, um, but taking it a killer whale very far, you're taking more and more risk. And, uh, the other three top train, top rank trainers that swam with her were afraid of her. And yeah. they would even say, you know, a lot of times they would say, you know, Oh, Takara is vocal out there. And say, if they were, they were planning on swimming with her for the show and they would say, uh, John, I'm not going to swim with her. You know, you, you know, you can have her. And I said, okay, I'll, t- I'll swim with her. So even when she was upset uh, about something, you know, in her social environment or whatever, um, I knew I could still swim with Takara and be safe. And, um, and she responded to that. But now you also said they forced you to do artificial insemination right. against that. And how did she react to that? And how did you feel when, it, when, you, when you had to do it? Oh man, it was, uh, it was awful because, you know, also I have to say, you know, that, that there's the uh, dichotomy of how I was at the beginning of my career. I was, I was the, I was the, the, on the first team to train the first successful artificial insemination in the world. And that was on Takara's mother, Kasaka. So not only did I help train it, but I also was working Takara, I'm sorry, Kasaka the day that we actually performed it in the year 2000. And I remember how I was then where we felt like um, we were pioneers, you know, and, and and we were, I mean, this was the first successful one in the world. Um, And I remember being so uh, happy about it. And, you know, we, we made it such a big deal for Kasaka, like what a great girl she was and, you know, just played with her and everything. And then now years later, because, now I've evolved as a as a human being, as a trainer, and I've seen what captivity has done to these whales. Um, you know, I'm a very different person at the end of end of my career and a very different trainer than I was back when we did the first ever artificial insemination on Kasaka. So, you know, now I'm fi- I'm fighting it. I'm fighting management that we shouldn't do it and we shouldn't do it as frequently as we're doing it or uh, taking the calves away from the mother. So now instead of being joyous about this and celebrating it and thinking it's some great thing and you're a part of something fantastic, I'm looking at this as that this is a stain upon humanity and I have to try to stop it. Like these, these whales that I love so much, I don't want them to go through this. Even though I had a lot of power day to day, you know, what decisions were being made around the pool on the big, big stuff. I'm completely powerless to that. You know, I mean, the corporation, if they say this is what we want, then this is what you're going to do. And, you know, when some people have asked me, they're like, well, why didn't you say 
just say, I don't want to, I don't want to do the artificial insemination on Takara. Well, the answer to that is then another trainer with less of a relationship with Takara um, would have done it. And I knew that with my relationship with her and how much I cared about her and how well I knew her going back to even the California days that I could make her as most comfortable as she could be, you know, because I also had the ability, like if she was uncomfortable, I could tell the vets to stop and step back over the wall. And there was no better person to be able to have Takara's best interest in that setting and to make sure she was as comfortable as she could be than, than me. So uh, even though it broke my heart to have to do it on her, I, you know, the entire time, just for example, you know, I'm, you know, I'm holding on to Takara um, and while this process is being done on her and I'm just telling her over and over again, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you know, and, and I, I believe, I believe she knew. I believe she knew. I mean, these animals are so hyper aware and they have all the emotions that human beings do. And for a long time, scientists tried to say that that wasn't possible. And now most scientists say that it is possible. Only a minority of scientists say that animals don't have the capacity to have human-like emotions. And I can tell you from my personal experience of working every single day for 14 years with these animals, that they absolutely, without a doubt, have the same emotions that people have from jealousy to anger to love. Um, and, and, you know, whatever love means, if you could ask human beings, five different people to write on a piece of paper, what define love for me? And if you collected those papers and read it, you would get five different answers. So. Mm-hmm. So does that mean when something happens and they react and you know it's not great for them, then do you ask them for forgiveness? The entire time I was, because I was in control of Takara, I I was the trainer working her for the procedure. And the entire time that this procedure is going on, because remember, I had to train it also. So I've trained her on this procedure and now I'm in control of her while the procedure is actually happening. And, um, you know, in this place, uh, obviously more than one time, but I'm, I'm telling her the entire time during the entire process, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I tried to stop this. You know, I love you and I couldn't stop it. You know, I'm talking to her just like you would talk to a person Mm -hmm. and, you know, whether animals, um, or even people for that matter that are from different cultures and different languages, you know, understand an exact word. Um, when we, when we verbalize something, our body also communicates what our words are. So our bodies mimic what we have said verbally. And that's why I would also teach younger trainers, like, you know, talk to them, don't treat them as like some animatronic machine, you know, like if you yeah. talk to them and you, you know, your body will follow, your body will react and, and, and that, that communication is universal. Yeah. And so, you know, so I believe without a doubt that these animals understand, you know, also what, where our emotions are, you know, she can see whether if it's something that I'm excited about or if it's something that I am um, anxious about, or that, you know, that, that I don't want to do, or I'm, I'm hesitant. They pick up on all of those behavioral cues better than people do. Yeah. So, so John, was this the turning point for you? We went into some detail here with the artificial insemination, but you saw other things and you were, you allowed other things to happen. And even this, you allowed to happen to a degree is this the line or is this the turning point in your career at SeaWorld that said, I can't do this anymore? Yeah. I mean, I definitely would push back a little bit and say that I didn't allow it. I mean, I definitely fought it and tried to stop it. I never openly endorsed it. Um, but um, I would say, I mean, you're absolutely right. A lot of, when I came back to SeaWorld after France uh, and came and, and this time I was at the Texas park, um, things had changed 
and what had changed the most was that now the artificial insemination program was really ramped up. And when females would have a calf, we were taking that calf away from the mother and sending them to another park, whatever the park needed. And this was a, a, a big shift, even though it happened when I was at the California SeaWorld, um, this, the things had changed and it was um, happening a lot more frequently. And, mm-hmm. um, and so that really bothered me. Um, and I, cause you could see when this happens, it's incredibly traumatic for both the mother and the calf. Mm-hmm. Um, people, when I say that and people may be getting a mental image, you have no idea how awful it is. I mean, even if you can think in your mind, the, the worst you can imagine, I can tell you it's 10 times worse than that. These animals absolutely freak out. And they, you know, they slam the steel gates and they, you you know, they, they thrash around, they make vocalizations we've never heard before. Um, It's such a traumatic event. And it's so traumatic that, for example, with Kasaka and Takara, that um, recorded vocalizations of Takara. So they were in, in Florida, they recorded Takara's vocalizations and they played them for Kasaka in California. And Kasaka had an, an aggressive response to that. She started swimming very fast around the perimeter of the pool. She actually slid out and tried to grab a trainer. Um, and luckily she wasn't able to get a hold of that trainer or that trainer would not be alive today. So w- there was a rule after that that Takara and Kasaka could not hear each other's vocalizations or see each other in video because we were afraid of the response that it would take. Because I made a video, Takara used to love, sorry to go off on this tangent a little bit, but it's important. Takara, ever since she was a little kid, um, she would love to watch the video screen. And as a kid, she used to actually split in, in the middle of the show. And instead of doing shows, she would watch the Jumbotron. <laughs> so <laughs> I actually would um, I use that as a reinforcer for her when she was being really good. I would um, let her, you know, I would point her to the screen and have her watch it. And so I actually used it to my advantage and her advantage. And so, you know, all these years later, when we're both in the Texas park, I would do set up where I was um, um, had would have a, the video camera on me and have another trainer um, holding her. And then the camera would then would would play me on the jumbotron. And and then the trainer who I had holding to car, they would point her to the screen. So now she's watching me on the screen and I would give her the signals and she would would be a hundred percent correct on those signals. So I would use, and she would, she would really get excited and motivated for that type of stuff because, you know, it's novel, it's unique and she's, you know, it's, it's me and our relationship and the screens incorporated into it. So I wanted to have the California park make a video where the trainers that used to swim with the car and had a strong relationship with her, um, would all say something to her and talk to her and, and then also the other whales and especially Kasaka and, um, a good friend of mine at the time, but you know, who later sold me out for SeaWorld. Um, she said, yeah, you know, that sounds great. We'll do it, but Kasaka can't be in the video. And I said, well, why not? And then that's when she explained to me what had happened with the recorded vocalizations Mm -hmm. of Takara to Kasaka. So she's like, so now there's a rule that they can't hear each other's vocalizations or see each other because we're afraid of the response and, you know, that we'll have another aggressive response. And, and just the, so here it is years later after they've been separated and the trauma is still very, very present in these whales. Well, the, the idea yeah. that, you know, the utopia is gone, you know, is there that moment that yeah. you understand that you yes. know you can't do it anymore. What is that moment that says you can't just keep going with with their with their way of doing things? You know that's well put because that was in my mind how I how I said it to myself was at the end was that I 
I cannot do this anymore. And it took, it took me a long time. I fought it. I fought it for years. Um, you know, cause I, when I came back and I saw that, that the number one importance was artificial insemination and they, they, they saw no problem with taking the calf away from the mother, um, even if it was only a couple of years old. And these were things that were just horrific to me. And I couldn't believe that this is where, where we were and this is what our priority was. And um, so, you know, there, all these thoughts go through the mind like, oh, okay, I'm going to leave. But then that's when the guilt comes in is like, you can't just walk away. I can't just never show back up again and never see Takara. Like, a, like so, you know, I spend all these years with her and the other whales. And then all of a sudden, I just never show back up and just abandon them. So you, you, you're, you're trapped in this cycle of guilt of that, okay, I don't want to be complicit anymore in this machine and this exploitation of these whales and, and us, the trainers, but the guilt of just feeling like you're abandoning these whales that are dependent on you, that you're, you're their only um, reprieve of this stagnation of cap, you know, just these concrete walls and this completely sterile environment and floating at the surface doing nothing. I, I mean, it, it's, it's so horrific when you think about it, like what their lives are reduced to. And the only reprieve from that is when we have a session and when we have a show and we're actually interacting with them or, you know, before Dom was killed and we were swimming with them every day, you know, these were things that motivated them and they were excited about them. And the reason why, because people was like, oh, well, are you, and you know, are you saying that they should be swimming with the whales? It's like, well, what I'm saying is the point I'm making is that um, when they have nothing, when you're in a completely sterile environment, of course, they would be motivated by these, these novel things in their environment. Because there's nothing else for them to do. And this, yeah. is a, this is the only time that their brain is able to work. And, and you can challenge them. And, and, and certainly the, the, the best way to do that is in the water. I mean, the, there's, there's so many more things that you can do in the water with a killer whale and, and different behaviors than on land. But of course, that makes it much more dangerous, of course, for the trainer. That's just common sense. But so you're trapped in the cycle of guilt. Uh, mm -hmm. And that guilt keeps you. And it kept me for a long time. And I remember telling this same person that I referred to before that we used to be best friends. We were best friends for 20 years until she decided to lie about me and, and, def and defend SeaWorld. And that was her decision. And she'll have to live with that. But she, um, I remember she told me one day, she's like, John, you cannot stay there for Takara when you're this unhappy. And I said, and I, I don't want to use her name, but I said, you know, I, I know that. I know that on paper. I know that. But I cannot bring my heart to do that. I cannot just walk away from her. And then a lot of, so a lot of things happened at the very end in a very condensed period of time. So we were um forcibly artificially inseminating Takara again I was on her team so and her team leader so I was having to do it um I and I already knew that they were planning on as soon as that calf was born taking Takara's current calf Sakari taking her away from her so I already knew that was in the plan um so I was fighting management every day about that um and then um I, I had a serious injury in the water where I broke my ribs. It wasn't aggressive. It was just my foot slipped on a big behavior. But that injury really, really was a, a serious one. My, the doctors were really surprised that it didn't stop my heart. Um, and it, I broke my ribs in the front and, and in the back and put me out of commission for a solid month. But um, And then right after that, um, Alexis was killed by by Keto, uh, a whale that I also used to work with and swim with when he was in the California park. That happened on Christmas Eve. We still swam in the water. Uh, management gave us the directive to hide the fact that Alexis was dead. Um, so you can imagine 
how that makes me feel as a trainer. Mm -hmm. I'm continuing to go out and sell this product of Utopia and how perfect my life is and have the coolest job in the world. And I know one of my colleagues is dead and we're yeah. hiding it. Alexis Martinez is a, is a, he, he's a trainer at, at Laurel Park, which SeaWorld was affiliated with. And uh, these trainers, they were dolphin trainers, but they trained for a couple of years in the Texas park to try to learn how to work with killer whales. And then SeaWorld sent four of their killer whales over um, to Laurel Park. This, so they had a business arrangement. And um, because they, that park did not have any killer whales. So this was the first time they were ever going to have killer whales. And so um, this is what happens when you take a, a group of inexperienced trainers. They, it was a very rushed job. You cannot train dolphin trainers just for two years and think that they have the ability to work with killer whales. And um, Alexis was killed and partly dismembered by Keto. And that happened on Christmas Eve. And then, like I said, we were given the directive to hide the fact that he was dead. And we still, two days later, I was out doing shows in the water with killer whales, pretending like I lived a perfect life. Mm, and then yeah. um, six, 60 days after um, Keto killed Alexis, then Tillicum killed and dismembered Don Branshaw. And Don not only was a colleague, but I knew Don and had been friends with Don for nine years. Yeah. And, and it wasn't, so people think like, oh, do, uh, so that made you like afraid of the whales and that's what, no, not at all. I wasn't afraid of the, of the whales at all. I never saw them in a different light. I knew that these whales were capable of that. I always knew that as an experienced trainer, we knew what they were capable of, but it was the corporation's response to their death. You know, yeah. Alexis, you're going to hide the fact that he was killed. Um, Adon, now you can't hide it because it happened in front of the public, but you're going to lie about what happened, how it happened and why it happened. You know, so when, when, when I, when all of this happened, you know, it was impossible to not see myself in seeing how they, how they were, how the corporation was spinning it and discussing about Alexis attributing it to, you know, it was his fault and also lying about the details of what happened to him um, and how that aggression happened, you know, denying it was even aggression. Um, right. And then Dawn lying about all of those details and also placing the blame on her. How could I not see myself and say, look, tomorrow, if I'm grabbed and pulled in, like Dawn was grabbed and pulled in by Tilikum and I'm killed. Why would I think that the corporation is going to do anything different than what they're doing here? They're going to blame me for my own death and say it was my fault. It was at that point that the, the illusion, you know, I just couldn't do it anymore. It was, it was really all the passion inside of me for, uh, you know, doing this and, def and defending this company for so many years. It just died. It just died. Yeah. And I just knew, like, you know, I had reached that point of I cannot do this anymore. I cannot be complicit in this anymore. And yes, it's going to be crippling for me to leave these whales, which it was. Um, and I may never get over that guilt. I'm still not over it. And I left uh, seven years ago, um, seven and a half years ago. Um, and I still feel just as guilty as the day that I left. So, yeah. but... By speaking out and and giving my stories and and being a whistleblower and exposing this industry for really what it is, and also speaking about Takara and the other whales like I've done here, that that helps me with the guilt. It's like a, a therapy in some way. Yeah, you know, we mentioned Don, and a lot of people don't know about Alexis so much, but they know the Don Brancho story, and. You told you just told us how significant that was. How did that get you to decide to participate in the movie Blackfish? And how significant was that to you? When the director of Blackfish, when she first approached me, um, well, I should actually go back. The, the, the how the director of Blackfish even knew about me is that. Um, I'm the one who leaked out to the world that Alexis was dead. I leaked it out anonymously through um, uh, a media article. 
And um, that journalist who I um, gave the story to about what happened to Alexis, um, he was involved, loosely involved with, with the director and the, and the film. And he asked me, would I be willing to speak to this director who's doing this documentary and, you know, for you. And, I, and, and I'm still working at Shamu Stadium. So I, I spoke with her and they really wanted me to do it. And, uh, and they were going to conceal my identity. <laughs> so, uh, which I don't know exactly how they were planning on doing it, but I, I was very nervous, but I had agreed to do it. And then the same person I keep re- referring to, who is my best friend of 20 years, um, she, you know, I, I told her about this and she said, John, they're going to know that it's you. There's only a handful of us that have this information and they're going to be able to tell, regardless of how they disguise your appearance or your voice, they're going to tell by your word selection and how you say it and what you choose to say. They're going to know that it's you. And I knew she was absolutely correct. So even though the director already had flights and the, you know, for, for everybody, for her, for herself, the crew, um, and hotel arrangements and everything two days before they were going to fly. Cause originally they were going to fly to Texas and film me. I called her and I just said, I can't do it. I have too much to lose. And they're going to, fi- they're going to find out that it's me. And, you know, you're also very fearful of SeaWorld. So it's not just like, Oh, you're found out and you're going to lose your job. SeaWorld doesn't work like that. They work like a cult. They'll go after you and they have gone after not only me, but other trainers, but they've gone after me as mo- most people are very aware but of the things that they've done to me for speaking out. Um, and they still pursue me whenever I do major media and stuff like that. They'll have private investigators follow me and uh, they, you know, they'll do smear campaigns on me. They, they, you know, they pull out, all, pull out all the stops. But um, so I, I told her I couldn't do it. I had too much to lose. I was afraid that they would know it was me. Um, she didn't put any pressure on me, but I knew they were really disappointed and they left me alone. And then um, I went, I left, uh, I went on a three month medical leave. I'd injured my right knee um, from swimming with the, the whales. And it was something that was a recurring injury for me. And so I went on three month protected FMLA leave, uh, Family Medical Leave Act. Mm -hmm. And during that three months, um, I had made the decision with my doctors because they they did not want me to return. They're just like, you're just going to do so much damage to this knee. They've been trying to get me to quit for years and I wouldn't do it. So with everything happening, I knew I was not going to come back. And so they, they reached out to me again, the director and that journalist, they reached out to me again and they, they, um, I don't remember how they, they found out that I was on three month leave. They found out somehow and they reached out to me and they said, you know, are you going to go back to SeaWorld? And I said, no. And they said, well, will you do it now? And I said, yes, I'll do it now. And now you don't have to conceal me and, you know, I'll be myself. And then when I resigned from SeaWorld, seven days, le- seven days after I resigned, they flew me to Seattle and I filmed my interview in Seattle for Blackfish. John Hargrove, the heralded orca trainer who blew the whistle on SeaWorld. That was part one of my conversation. In part two, the next installment, he talks about something he has never revealed in public before. That's what he says. And about how stopping the breeding of orcas may take some time and how the future for SeaWorld may be in China. Listen to my part two of my conversation with John Hargrove next on The PETA Podcast. that's our program. Hey, you can contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok. That's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K. Or on ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund blog. That's A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. Or on my personal website, amok.com. I 
Uh, once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our podcast episodes on Apple Podcasts or wherever you podcast or catch your pods. You can also rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. Remember, it helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on the PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo. Thank you.